So he hello everyone, my name is Chelsea Thompson. I am a consultant on the Microsoft Detection and Response Team. Um, and today I'm gonna to teach you about some simple tricks hackers use to take down some fairly large organizations. After I share these techniques, I'll teach you how to take the proper precautions and help prevent your organization from being the next victim of a cybersecurity attack. And you can still see my webcam, right? Or did it cut off? I'm not sure. <laughs> I think it's coming back now. Perfect. Yes, there you are. Okay, and you can still see the screen also, or is it only one at a time? No, we see both. Uh, okay. You are a smaller picture next to your bigger screen. You're in good right, shape. Perfect. So a little bit more about me. I joined Microsoft in 2016, right after uh, graduation as a part of the Microsoft College program. Last year, I made the transition to the dark team as an infrastructure specialist. Outside of that, I help lead multiple Microsoft community partnerships with various nonprofits. Uh, if any of you are in the Dallas area and looking for ways to get involved with Microsoft initiatives, feel free to let me know. But to get into the agenda today, um, we're gonna start by reviewing who, who the detection and response team are, and then we'll look at some trends that we see in the industry. And afterward, afterwards, I'll share some common issues that we run into in the field and wrap it up with a brief Q&A. So who is DART? The Microsoft Detection and Response Team is a small group within Microsoft Cybersecurity Solutions Group. Our team's mission is to quickly respond to security incidents and help our customers become cyber resilient. And now that I'm looking at that statement, in reality, we don't just help our customers. Uh, we try to help educate everyone we come into contact with on the importance of cybersecurity so that they can not only protect their business, but also protect their cells from the threats that are roaming. And we do this by organizing ourselves into a team with six different key roles that enable us to drive our mission. We have our program managers, team leads, infrastructure and for forensic specialists, reverse engineers, and developers. All of these roles make up our IR team. And we are highly specialized investigators who fly all across the world at the drop of a dime and help customers respond to incidents. So that's a little bit about myself and our team. So now into the speech. Uh, I call this a ticking time bomb uh, because for those of you who don't know, a ticking time bomb is a phrase used to describe a problematic situation that will eventually become dangerous if not addressed. And that's exactly what we deal with on the dark team. We go into the situations and we see multiple small issues that were left unaddressed and finally exploded into a huge incident. And it used to be every year we would hear about one of these ticking time bombs exploding, but now it seems like it's a monthly trend where a company makes the news as victims of a cyber attack. They continue to sustain reputational damage and um, only to be followed by another company who'll have an attack. So the cycle becomes kind of an endless cycle. And most people think of these cyber attacks as sophisticated incidents that would be hard for organizations to prevent or know about. But that's not what we see in most cases. Uh, the majority of the time when we visit a customer, we find numerous small, simple actions an organization could have taken to prevent the attack. And if these simple actions are not taken and an attacker infiltrates an environment, it can be tough to get them out or reverse the damage done. We will see attackers gaining full control of an organization's Active Directory, downloading terabytes of data, and hiding malware all over to maintain persistence. Um, with that said, it is critical to listen today and learn about how you can protect your organization and also learn about what is going on in the world. So first, I will level set a bit just to ensure everyone understands the different terms and attacker techniques we'll be discussing. Um, one of the biggest questions we get when we go on site is what are the latest trends in cybersecurity? Uh, this is always a topic of discussion. And one of the biggest trends we are seeing now, especially with the rise of COVID, is ransomware. And for those of you who don't know, ransomware is a form of malware where an attacker will encrypt a victim's file and demand some sort of payment. Now, initially, this may not seem like a big deal to many people. They think of it as, oh, a few people have lost some vacation photos. 
Uh, but the truth is, uh, for the organizations we deal with, ransomware causes vast disruptions. And these are Fortune 500 companies, government agencies, um, public transportation services, and you'll hear about them in this, and later in the slides. Um, we've even seen hospitals and schools being brought to a complete halt and having to be shut down because of ransomware. Another big question that follows this is who is doing the attacks? Um, sometimes these attacks are a simple person who, find, who finds a vulnerability within the organization. But another trend that we see now is the rise of APTs. And APT stands for Advanced Persistent Threat. Uh, this is a computer, net, a computer network uh, threat actor, and they can be thought of as a group of small time, a group of employees whose job it is to steal your data and compromise your network. So that is their main objective and what they do for a living. And because of this, we see a significant shift in how the attacks are being executed. There is now a focus on stealing credentials and moving laterally to gain access to multiple accounts. Attackers are also targeting internet facing system and going as far as disabling antivirus. Um, so that just kind of shows you how they're becoming uh, more strategic and targeted with their attacks because they're now human operated attacks. So now that you have some background, let's jump right in. This is about how a tweet brought an entire organization down. So on January 10th, a group called Project Zero India, with said good intentions, uh, released a tweet about a vulnerability within Citric Netscaler. This vulnerability allowed for directory traversal and remote code execution on Citric controllers. An attacker could now change passwords, allowing them to gain access to an entire environment. So essentially, what they did when they released this tweet was say, hey world, Here's a vulnerability and here's how to exploit it, but please do not do it. Um, so what do you think happens? Um, a, threat actor, a threat actor capitalized on this. Um, this organization was hit less than 24 hours after the tweet went out. The attacker came in and stayed silent in the environment for a month. And they then came in, came back and established some command and control channels. And for those of you who don't know, Command and control channels are used by attackers to send commands to systems within the network. Um, these are systems that they have already compromised. And this provides them with the ability to have continuous communications and issue commands to the, issue commands to the systems. So next, after they've laid kind of low for a month and they established these command and controls, the attacker then went on and did a full encryption on the entire enterprise. Because of this, the organization no longer had access to things like emails, internal websites, or just essential tools needed to run basic business. We were in the and we were in the environment essentially playing a cat and mouse game with the with the attacker um, until we finally got them out. Um, the attacker even went so far as to attempt to ransomware things that we were putting in the environment. So this just shows how persistent they were uh, once they did get in. And, and here's a depiction um, of how the attacker came to exploit this vulnerability within the environment. Uh, after using the exploit code, attackers, the attacker could then move laterally compromising additional accounts. Um, and this happens when organizations do things like share local admin passwords to all machines. Um, from there, the attacker could then push out malware to many machines. Uh, once this happens, it can take weeks to get the attacker out the environment and restore critical business systems. So just imagine that, uh, imagine going weeks without having access to your email or communication methods and your business is just at a halt essentially. And that just kind of shows how impactful these attacks are. So what are some of the things our team does uh, when this happens? And how do we find and stop the attacker and essentially save the day? Because that's what people consider us. We're like the heroes uh, when these incidents happen. Um, first, we start by deploying our monitoring tools. Um, we utilize Defender ATP 
and we push this out to all endpoints. Um, afterwards, we will take all the alerts and begin to prioritize uh, relevant alerts um, to the incident. It is important to remember that security alert tools can be very, very noisy. Um, and alert fatigue is real and we see it all the time. So making sure you take time to prioritize those events and have an escalation process for um, when critical alerts are found. Um, we then, we then uh, do a KGBT and password reset on all the admin accounts. And uh, what this is, is a strategic process where we work to regain control of the Active Directory. So once we kind of gain control back of the uh, Active Directory, we'll focus on isolating compromised machines. Um, it's critical to pull those compromised machines off the network uh, as soon as possible. You don't have to turn them off, but just get them off the network. Uh, and uh, as you see the different C2 channels pop up, when we see these, we'll make sure that we're blocking these. And Defender has an amazing capability where we can block these channels um, using Defender. Uh, finally, a key thing we do is review machines that are missing patches, and particularly the internet facing ones, because we know this is where attackers go after. And this is how we were able to discover vulnerabilities like the missing patch, which led, which led us to find out how the attackers infiltrated the environment. Now on to prevention. This attack could have been prevented. The organization uh, could have not had to halt their entire business if simple actions were taken. So here's some key things that could have been done that would have helped prevent uh, your organization or the organization um, from having this attack curve. Uh, the first thing is make sure you're not using shared local administrator passwords. That's gonna be a common theme you're gonna hear about in many of the uh, issues I shared today. Um, and majority of the organizations that we go out to, they're still doing this. Uh, next, have a, have a dis disaster recovery plan in place and make sure you test it. We see where a lot of organizations, they have this on paper, but no one knows where it's at uh, or no one, and they don't know what to do when it occurs. And they're essentially scrambling when, when a cyber attack happens um, because they just didn't expect it to happen. Uh, another thing you can do is block communication to certain ports like uh, 445. Um, if that port was blocked, that would have helped prevent this attack from occurring. And all of these recommendations go back to what I was initially saying, where you have to check for the small things because if, if they are left unaddressed, uh, they will eventually explode. Um, none of the things on this slide are uh, impossible tasks for an organization to do. They're simple things that can be done. Um, now let's shift gears a bit and talk about the dark side of the cloud. Um, this is a hot topic right now, especially with everyone making the shift to remote work and migrating from on-prem. And because of this, we've seen an increase in cloud-related attacks. So the revealing spray, I kind of added this corny title to it just to uh, keep things interesting. But this is about how a simple password spray allows hackers access to an organization's most sensitive and privileged accounts and data. For those of you who don't know, a password spray is a method where attackers attempt to access a large number of accounts using commonly used passwords. So things like go Seahawks123 or I am a Bama fan, I'm from Alabama, so Roll Tide would be one of ours. Um, Common passwords, attacker will try those. Um, and this is a simple technique with free software available on the web. Um, I've deployed this in a lab before. It's quick and easy, not anything hard. Um, as you can see in the example, the code is simply pulling a list of users and just trying the same a password to see if it will work on one of the accounts. Now, this is how the attack will look in Azure Active Directory. Uh, as you see, there are a bunch of failed authentication attempts on different user accounts around the same time from the same location. Uh, because organizations have thousands of, the, thousands of these authentication requests an hour, uh, password sprays can be easily missed if not pay attention to. 
And that's precisely what happened. I know you can't see the location because I have it blurred out, but yeah, all these attacks came from the, the same location. Just trust me on that. Um, but yeah, that's what happened to in this scenario. Um, the password spray was successful in guessing one user account password. All it took was one user making the mistake of having a weak password to start this attack. Now, imagine if this happened in your organization. Um, do you trust every employee to have a strong password? I guarantee there's probably one person who either has the same password for all their accounts, including their work accounts, or has that weak password like password123. Um, and remember that you are only as strong as your weakest password. But this attack was done by a group um, and their focus was on data ex data exfiltration. Um, and, and they were smart because uh, they strategically only attempted to log into each account a few times to prevent any alarms from being triggered. So this allowed them to linger in the environment for months undetected. Um, so they did the spray, got the password corrected, and then kind of just laid low and was exfiltrating data. Um, now let's look at a, a depiction of how this password spray could have been executed. Um, when attackers are strategic, they will hack an admin account, as we see here, and then grant additional permission to standard users. So that is a trend we see. And now they no longer must have, they, they no longer have to use that admin account. Um, the, and the admin accounts are heavily monitored. That's why they don't want to continue using them. They now can pivot and use a standard user accounts. They're not as closely monitored and that they have given these special permissions to do certain things. And one of the overlooked permissions um, that they will add to these standard user accounts and that happened in this scenario is the ability to view mailboxes. Now, what this essentially does is it gives all users, including the attacker's non-standard account, uh, the, the ability to view admin mailboxes. Um, now, why is this important and why would they want to do this? Well, with this elevated mailbox permission, essentially what they do is they will monitor the critical accounts like those of security team members. Um, and this gives them access to privileged information so that they can maintain awareness and detection. Uh, if a breach was detected, the attacker would actually now be the first person to know because they are monitoring that security person's mailbox. Um, and this is because uh, we, we all have a habit of when we set up these monitoring softwares and go back into your own organization and just look, look at this, um, uh, we use our standard work email to send alerts to. Uh, our tool, Defender ATP, it asks like, what email do you want to send if we, not we notice a breach? And people will say, oh yeah, just my work email. Um, not thinking about things like uh, that your communication method could be compromised and being monitored if an attacker is in the environment. Uh, so this is uh, very important to make sure you have a separate email that is not uh, tied to your work uh, to have these alerts sent out to and to use to communicate if you do suspect an attack. Um, in this case, the organization was only able to become aware of the attack after a user noticed months later that they had permissions they shouldn't have had. Um, and here's another key, constantly review account access and um, audit changes to, uh, audit changes that are made on these accounts. Um, if they were auditing these changes, they would have seen that, hey, we we would have never gave access for everyone to read admin mailboxes. Um, so that is a critical piece. So now we'll pivot into our final uh, issue and um, we'll learn some about phishing attacks. Um, and for those of you who don't know, a phishing attack is a social engineering method where an attacker will portray to be a trusted resource but usually intending to steal data. And let's see if I can get my clicker to work. Um, 
and there and there are many types of phishing attacks, uh, but one key trend that we see on the rise now is the spear phishing attacks. Um, while regular phishing campaigns will go after large number a large number of relatively low yield targets, these spear phishing attacks will target specific accounts by using emails crafted for their intended victim. Um, we've seen examples where a, a librarian would be receiving customized emails about a fake conference, uh, a fake reading conference. Um, and this is something they'll be more enticed to click on because it's tailored for them. It doesn't look as suspicious as the traditional spam attacks. And in this case, the spear phishing attack, um, which like I said, started as just a custom email that was sent out to a user and they clicked on it, it crippled communications and infected almost all client in all clients, um, clients and servers for this organization. Uh, this caused a complete operational shutdown. Uh, the customer had to revert back to using pen and, pen and paper for day-to-day -day functions. So just imagine like you go into work today and everything is down and you have to now learn how can I go, how can I use paper and pen and paper to do my daily job? Um, as you might see, this can cause a huge problem. Now let's look at a depiction of how a phishing attack could cripple an organization. So after one user clicks on the phishing email, their computer is infected and their credentials are stolen. Um, and, they, and we've even seen uh, phishing attacks become so sophisticated now to where you don't actually have to click on the link in the email, you just have to open the email. And from opening the email, it starts running that malicious code. So uh, these attacks, these, these phishing attacks are getting very uh, tricky. Um, but once the, the attacker gets in, they affect your computer and they steal your credentials, um, they will then, like we saw on the other attacks, attempt to move laterally. That is a big thing for attackers. They love to steal additional credentials um, off the user's machines. Um, and their goal is to get an admin credentials or someone who is a global admin or um, has elevated access. So many organizations make this very easy. And this goes back to that previous story. Uh, they make this easy because they have things, um, they're doing things like sharing the same local admin password on every computer. Uh, so once they get the local password off that one machine, they, they now have uh, the admin password for every machine in your organization. Uh, this highlights the importance of using, of not using shared local admin passwords and enforcing a solution like LAPS. Um, LAPS stands for Local Administrator Password Solution. This is actually a free solution offered by Microsoft. And we do not see, I don't, not even, I would say half of the organizations that we go into to respond to an incident have LAPS configured. And if LAPS was configured, it could have prevented um, the attack or helped prevent the impact of the attack from occurring. So that's pretty interesting because something like a free solution that is publicly available could stop some of these attacks and organizations still are not using it. But once they have these credentials, attackers will then spread their malicious code to every machine. Um, and they will just wait until they will wait until the uh, code is on all these machines before they actually deploy the ransomware. But once they do this, the organization is left to just simply hope that their whatever uh, endpoint protection tool they have will stop the attack. And we see many cases of, uh, depending on the tool that's used, um, the protection tool does not stop the ransomware and it brings down the entire organization. Um, and like I said, this can leave the organization crippled for weeks at a time. And in this instance, they were left to pen and paper, all because of a simple email. So now that you've heard about 
how these attackers are using these simple but yet devastating attacks. Let's talk about detection and protection. Um, how can you take this information, apply it, and protect your company? Uh, step one, um, before you make any changes, make sure you have a break glass account. Um, we, we have a well-documented process and I'll, I'll share out when I'm on this slide. You can review it at a later time on how to properly set up a break glass account. It's also on, on Microsoft's public uh, page. But when implementing these security changes, we want to make sure that you do not get locked out of your account. We have seen that happen. Um, it's not a fun experience and you will have to call support and do a bunch of unnecessary things to get back in your uh, environment. So make sure uh, before you, you make changes, try to keep an attacker out, you don't lock yourself out. And also, I forgot to note on a slide, but make sure you have a solid backup in place um, and test that backup. Uh, note that, that there is a key difference between backups and snapshots. We, we saw one time when an organization took a snapshot thinking it was a backup and tried to restore from that snapshot once the ransomware hit and it was impossible to do. So making sure you have solid backups, you tested that backup, you know it works, you know you can recover your, you know you can recover your organization from there, um, and uh, then making sure you uh, document any changes that are made in your environment. So knowing who made the change, why they made it, um, and how it's going to impact the organization, having that change control and process before you make any of these changes is critical. So next, have separate administrator accounts. Um, one of the most common ways we see attackers get in is through internet, is through internet facing things um, like phishing attacks. Um, I would say almost 80% of the attacks we see originate from the internet. Um, and a simple solution to help, to help with this is to create two separate accounts um, for anyone who's an admin. Admins should have one account that is for their day-to-day -day productivity, um, activities like checking their email and surfing the web. And they should have another account for their high privilege uh, admin activities, things like uh, accessing domain controller. And these, two and these two accounts shouldn't be used together. You should not be surfing the web and playing games on the with the same account that you are administering domain controllers on. Um, and to provide an additional layer of security, um, you also will need separate devices to use uh, when you have these accounts. So remember, we saw where attackers, when they do come in, they will try to, they will try to uh, steal credentials off machines. So it is important to make sure that you're not logging in um, to your you're not logging in with your privilege account on a machine that you administer email on. Having separate accounts, separate machines, and uh, just tearing this off is critical to preventing these attacks. Next, remove permanent admin access. Um, unless, uh, unless you're capable or you have an employee who is capable of working 24 hours straight nonstop, which I have not seen that yet, uh, there's no reason to have permanent admin access at all, whether on-prem or in the cloud. Admin privileges should be checked out and expire after a certain amount of time. Um, this way, if in a, if in a um, this way, if an attacker does steal admin credentials uh, after a certain amount of time, they will have limited ability to perform damage in your network. Uh, Microsoft has an amazing uh, tool called PIM. Uh, PIM stands for Privilege Identity Management. It's a quick and easy solution, takes about five minutes to configure. And uh, PIM coupled with MFA will make an attacker's life very hard. And attackers like easy, not hard. Um, and essentially what PIM does is it requires admins to go in and check out their privileges. Um, once they check out the privilege, they can then, then um, do the global admin or whatever things they need to do. 
And after a certain amount of time, that privilege will expire. And they have to go in and recheck out that privilege again um, to have access. Uh, for on-premise, uh, having some type of uh, identity man a privilege access, identity manage and management, there are plenty of third parties. Um, Microsoft used to, used to have a, a solution called PAM, but like I said, there are plenty of third parties out there that will help you set that up. And it's just critical to have to prevent those permanent admins access. And next is conditional access. This is another five minute configuration. Um, and what this does is it allows you to enforce security requirements and provide an additional layer of protection. Um, for example, if you know that none of your admins work outside the US, implementing a security policy to block users from logging into uh, these admin accounts from outside location would uh, provide that additional layer of sec uh, secu uh, security. Um, when we saw that password spray, right, the location, the location that the admin logged into when they did this password spray was from a country that the real admin would have never logged in from. So if they would have had this policy in place to say, hey, if you're not within the country that the admin lives in, you cannot log in and access this account. Um, that would have made it much harder on the uh, on the attacker. Uh, also, conditional access uh, can enforce things like MFA, um, sign-in risk, so blocking users if the tool suspects their account is has been compromised, or, or if the uh, and also blocking uh, sign in if they're signing. I'm sorry, and also blocking sign in if the user is attempting to log in from a device that is known to be compromised. That is critical, and all of this can be done through conditional access. Like I said, a five minute process that will make uh, attackers' lives very hard. So on to some environmental hygiene uh, action items that should be taken. Um, we'll start off by first and foremost, one of the biggest ones is disabling legacy authentication. Um, legacy authentication refers to an authentication request uh, made by older office clients um, that don't use modern authentication. And this is important because this type of authentication passes the user's account name and password in clear text. Um, you also cannot prevent, you also cannot enforce MFA um, when legacy authentication is being used. So this is something that you need to get rid of as soon as possible. And Microsoft was actually going to uh, make this a permanent thing this year, but because of COVID, they're pushing it out to next year. So it's good to go ahead and get a head start on removing this and you can find uh, legacy auth clients by doing a quick search under microsoft sign-ins and filtering on legacy auth clients um, this is a very quick and easy process as you see in the pictures a few clicks a few clicks of a buttons will allow you to uh, discover these uh, accounts now on to the big one um, MFA, and this is something I feel like we will preach about forever. Uh, if you do not do any of the recommendations I present today, this is the one. I, if you only do one, sorry, this is the one you have to do. MFA is the biggest one. Uh, as you see on our shirts, uh, these are shirts that we get at our conferences. Uh, passwords are broken, enable MFA. Um, I feel as though majority of the attacks that we see would not occur if MFA was in place. Um, that is a common theme in these top these top stories I share with you today. Uh, MFA would have shut them down and prevented them from escalating the way they did. Uh, and you can uh, enable MFA by simply going into your conditional access policy and enforcing it. Um, if you can't enforce MFA for everyone within your organization, at minimum, it needs to be done for anyone with admin privileges. And what we see is when we go into an organization, we see that they don't have MFA and we say, oh, why didn't you have it? 
and they have all these different excuses. Oh, we didn't want to disrupt the users. Um, meanwhile, they're writing on pen and paper. But by the end of the time we leave, and our engagements are usually only one or two weeks long, they have then made a big exception and MFA is pushed out. Um, as you can see on the screen, if you go into Azure Usage and Insights page, you can view how many users are registered for MFA. Um, the key is to get as many users registered first before you enforce it to, to avoid disruption. So that's one of the main reasons people say, oh, we don't want to uh, enable MFA because it's going to cause disruption for users. Um, you can roll this out in phases and kind of handhold users through it. I also find it helpful if the organization first enables users for self-service password reset before enabling MFA. And what self-service password reset does is it, one, uh, takes all the work off uh, the help desk, right? And it kind of avoids some of those social 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 engineering attacks that we might see because you, you now don't have users calling a help desk and saying, hey, reset my password. Um, they can now do it on their own. But another thing self-service password reset does is it sets the groundwork for the prereqs for MFA. So once they're onboarded with self-service password reset, uh, they'll be able to effortlessly, effortlessly uh, utilize MFA. So if you're admin, um, go in, check out what your numbers are for your organizations and work to get this number increased. Next is role-based access control, also called RBAC. Um, this can be used to assign users specific privileges based on their need. One of the first things we do when we go into our customer environments is uh, we run a script um, that will allow us to see how many global admins and domain admins are in the environment. So we're looking at both the cloud and on-prem. Do you have an excess amount of users? And most of the time, we will see hundreds of people with excess privileges. And when we start to ask like, well, why does this person have this privilege? Or why are they needing to do this? Um, many people, they don't know. It's like, oh, well, they've always had it. So we just left it that way. Um, but these excess privileges give users full control into the environment and create an additional hole that attackers could exploit. RBAC, on the other hand, helps enforce the principle of least privilege. Um, and the principle of least privilege is only give users the bare minimum of what they need. Uh, so no excess privileges. Uh, and that's what RBAC helps with. And the overall goal you should see is let's increase the amount of users uh, in your MFA and decrease the amount of privileges. So go in, take some time, audit how many use audit all your admin users how many admin users do you have and determine do they really need that do you really need global admin to do help desk things no rbac actually has a help desk uh, role um if you need to administer cloud devices that is a role dynamics 365 a role many other things that people need to do it's already a role within rbac and they don't need global admin And uh, finally, um, one of the key recommendations is to review risk events in Azure AD. Um, one of my favorite features in risk events uh, is the leak credentials. If you haven't checked that out, please do so. But the leak credential feature is a report that will warn you of a, user's of a username and password combination that has been exposed on a dark web. So Microsoft, um, they go out and they check the dark web and um, they check the dark web for these different combinations of username and passwords, and then they go into the Azure environment and does a comparison against uh, the current username and passwords. And if there's a hit, it will then show up as leak credentials. If you see this alert, uh, immediately reset that user's password uh, and get that account reset. You can also see things like impossible travel alerts. So if a user signs in from Australia and then two hours later from Canada, that can be suspicious. And uh, these are things that are often ignored or missed 
but this information gives our team insight post breach as to how the attack got the attack got into the environment so when we go on site this this is what we're looking for um and this information was already available to the customer they just missed it so pay close attention to these um, these alerts um another great website that I like to use is uh, have I been um, have I been pwned com um, this allows you to enter your username and password and see if there's any security breaches associated with your account and uh, as you can see um, I typed in my old school email and uh, it was actually associated with a breach I know when I knew when this occurred because I had to reset my username and password but go in check out your own account see if there are any breaches associated with your accounts um, but yeah Take a look at this feature, it's very nice. If you have the Azure licenses, um, make sure you're utilizing it. Um, if not, get on board, because uh, this can really help prevent you from spending a lot of money and having to meet my team. Um, because we're essentially the team you never want to meet. That's what everyone says. They do not want to meet us, because uh, if you do meet us, you're, sent, you're, you're having a bad day. Now, but now that you have that information, um, upper management is going. Uh, now that you have all this information, uh, one thing upper management is going to ask you is, uh, well, is it worth it? Are taking all these mitigations I just talked about valuable to the business? Like, does it cost more uh, just to have the attack occur? And uh, while every business venture is different, um, it is important to note that the damage caused by these attackers are often uh, far greater than the price aligned with keeping you and your company safe. Um, it's become a matter of not if, but when your organization will be the next one. Um, and being proactive and getting protected helps make sure your organization does not have to spend days, months, or years attempting to recover from a data breach. Um, Thus, the bottom line is it's, it's often cheaper to invest in these ways to defuse the bomb than wait till it, it explodes. And that's what we see organizations do. They wait because they don't want to invest. They don't want to spend the money in these type of things. And then they have to pay for us to come out um, on top of losing money because all their systems are down just to have to, just to go back and still pay for those same uh, proactive things that they could have done in the beginning. So I'll, I'll just end with this, control your environment, because if you don't, someone else uh, will. Um, and uh, with that said, I guess I'll just do a quick thank you to my DART team members who helped me put this slide together. Um, Ryan, for connecting me with this amazing opportunity to talk to you guys. Um, Ian Smith, he's actually the person who uh, found one of the key vulnerabilities within uh, this presentation, very smart person. Um, but with that said, that's the end of my presentation. Feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. I would love to hear about some of the things that your organizations are doing to stay protected. Um, and also, we do have a proactive engagement at Microsoft where, where we'll come out and we'll assess your environment before an attack happens and then make recommendations on how to prevent it. Um, so this will just help you harden that environment and Prevent, from, prevent you from having to see us on a bad day, because that's what most customers do. They see us on a bad day, and that's not what I want. Um, as much as I do love flying across the country, I would love to see more customers proactively than reactively. So with that said, I think uh, I am done. I'm a fast talker, so apologies. I know it's a little early, but I'll open the floor to if there are any questions. Great presentation, Chelsea. Uh, no, no surprise there. I'm going to pull up the uh, the, the queue here, so I think we'll have a few questions. Uh, so let's start with Manjit. Manjit, I'm beginning to wonder if you're a human person. You are just, Manjit's been with us all day. We've started at eight o'clock. Uh, wow, so he, he asks, uh, service accounts for monitoring systems, what's the best method? For example, monitoring disk alerts cpu usage they need uh, the application needs uh, a password to connect so how, um, do you, how do you how do you suggest folks approach that yes so i didn't go in too deep into this but uh definitely look into what we call the tiering model um i think it's aka.ms tier i'm not quite sure but if you look it up online um 
we have this uh, happen to a lot of organizations where they don't know what to do with those service accounts. And what they essentially do is they give the service, they don't know what permissions the service accounts need. And one, they give the service accounts full access um, and then they don't even monitor these accounts. Uh, but the first step is tearing off these accounts. So creating different tiers within your Active Directory. Uh, if the service account is something that could control the whole environment, we call that tier zero, uh, putting it into the tier zero bucket. And that account should be closely monitored. Next, find out what privilege, what are the bare minimum privileges that account needs. Um, most service accounts do not need full access, but because we kind of get lazy and into a routine, that's what we do to make things work. We throw global admin, I mean, domain admin at it and say, you know what, it works. No. Find out the minimum amount of permission it needs. Give it, give it those permissions. Uh, put it as a tier one or tier zero account. Monitor it. Um, yeah. So yeah, that's that's the one key thing. Thank you. It's a great question though. Um, a lot of attacks that we do see come from service accounts. So hopefully that yeah, answers that's the question. Good one. That's a good one. So, so a follow-up to that. Um, any good recommendations on? And and I'm going to warn you, Andrew. I'll talk about this as well. But uh, uh, any good recommendations on how to approach cybersecurity from from Microsoft 365 and Office 365 for for somebody just moving into to cloud? Uh, yes. So, if you have the proper licenses, um, utilizing the Secure Score tool. Um, that's one of the first things we tell organizations to do is go in, look at that secure score, because what that does is it, one, evaluates your security posture, and then two, it gives you detailed recommendations on what you can do to protect your organization step by step. Um, they make it very simple for you. So utilizing that, especially if you're brand new into it, um, it can make things easier. And also some of the recommendations I put in the slide. So Chelsea, tell the audience that I didn't pay you to mention Secure Score. I, I feel like you're just saying. Oh no! <laughs> you're not no, you great. did not pay me to mention Secure Score. Uh, that is, when we go into uh, when we go into um, environments, especially when we're doing cloud investigations, we are leveraging we're, we're leveraging Secure Score. That's one of the things that we use ourselves as an IR team. Um, we're not doing anything sophisticated that you wouldn't know how to do. We go in, we look at your secure score. It tells us a report of, hey, they are lacking here, they are lacking there. Um, they need to do this, you need to do that. And uh, we read it off to you and say, hey, you're missing this. But it was already in your face, but sometimes it takes, I guess, a major incident, incident and then one of us coming out to print the paper out and say, here it is, for people to actually pay attention to those type things. But yeah, it's already in your face. <laughs> Nice, a Andrew. You're you're here at at the right time. So, Chelsea's topic when she she gave it to us, I think, was was one of the most interesting ever. Uh, but in the next session, we're going to be distilling the uh, the Microsoft cybersecurity reference architecture, and Secure Score is one of those key components we're going to use to break things down, even if you're brand new. And and your know, Chelsea's mentioned some really important things here. She was talking about how attackers. Uh, really hit on easy things and cheap things and when we're talking about you know local admin password solution for example and then you couple that with credential guard if you know heaven forbid you can get you know fully to windows 10 you've got your domain credentials covered you've got your local credentials covered um you know, it makes me really happy to hear chelsea saying these things you know the, my, my first customer that hired us you know right after we opened the door hired us because we predicted their breach three weeks before it would happen and it, it would have been prevented. We, we said go buy identity protection, get Azure AD P2 so we can have that risk, you know, facet and it would have made a big difference. And uh, you know, Chelsea's laid out a lot of really fundamental things, Andrew, that I think if you can, if, if we can draw the map for how you you sort of find your way to these, I think it's going to be uh, something anybody, anybody can do, but God forbid any of us, I, I feel like I, I want to go to Chelsea because I don't ever want her coming to me. So, so Chelsea, I think we've got just another question that popped in here. 
Um, um, just before even, yeah, just to build on what you just said, attackers are lazy is what we see. Um, they love the low hanging fruit. Um, if you make their life easier, they will come and capitalize on that. Um, if you make it harder by having things like MFA, PIM, um, Credential Guard all in place, uh, they're not gonna be knocking on your door too long uh, because they're gonna move to the next target who's easier. There are too many targets out there for them to just sit and bang on your door all day and get nowhere. There you, there you go, there you go. That's uh, good advice from the pro here. Let's see. Uh, so, so Chelsea, most of the orgs you're working with, are they they using Microsoft management tools like, like Configuration Manager? Um, no, we've actually seen um, a mix, mixed use. Um, a lot of third party tools. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a mixed use. Okay, so maybe maybe if if you're already on the uh, the Microsoft stack, uh, you know even for System Center that's going to be a plus because you with co-management you can hook into Intune and then we've got some new new capabilities there. Uh, so, so it does make our life easier when we do come on site if you are using Microsoft tools because that is what we know best. I know uh, people uh, expect Microsoft ex Microsoft people to be experts in everything, but when it comes to a lot of the third party tools, mm -hmm. uh, we are not the experts in it. We know a little bit about, about it to get by, mm -hmm. um, but we're gonna be leveraging you uh, when it comes to that. But if you have the Microsoft stack already there, when we come on site, we can 100% come in rocking and rolling and we can kind of move things forward on our own without having to say, well, you might have to ask third party about this, or you have to go talk to this person or that person. Mm -hmm. So, so Chelsea, you walk into an organization, they have Windows 10, they're, they're a small business, they have Windows 10, not a lot else. Um, what, are the, what are the first three things you're going to do on a, on, a, on a state of Windows 10 systems that are free and easy and, and implemented through, through policy? Um, what, I guess, what, what do we do? Uh, first, we're going to put Defender ATP on it, period. <laughs> um, <laughs> that is the first thing we are going to do. Uh, Defender ATP makes our life easier uh, because we do get a little bit lazy at times and Defender ATP does the work for us. It will go in and stop the attack or if not, it will alert us and say, hey, here's the attack. Uh, we can't sit and monitor a thousand machines. Uh, we do have a forensic tool that will do a deep analysis, uh, but we, can, we only have two weeks on site. We don't have time to do that across your whole organization. So that's where Defender ATP helps us out. Um, after we deploy Defender ATP, I guess the top number two thing we would do um, on those machines is if you are using, uh, if you're not, you, you don't have LAPS deployed, we're gonna put LAPS on it, definitely. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the time, uh, the attacker is leveraging that password that you have. So mm -hmm. putting LAPS on it. Um, and then number three, update it <laughs> if it's out of date we're going to update it so very simple things nothing complex uh and and what about uh like exploit guard do you all do you all you know, dip into defender antivirus and enabling the various elements of exploit guard or does that tend to be too too granular too much work thinking thinking about things like attack surface reduction you know enabling controlled folders for for anti-ransomware, do you get into that level of? Uh, no, our team actually doesn't, to be honest. Uh, we do recommend it uh, before mm -hmm. we leave. Uh, that's what we leverage, what we call our compromise recovery team. So mm -hmm. we only have two weeks on site and our goal is to get you back functioning. Mm -hmm. um, once we get you back functioning, then we have a, another specialized team at Microsoft called compromise recovery. And they're gonna come in and they're gonna be handling things like that. So making sure you can stay secure for the longevity. Wow. Yeah, we yeah. Do, we do recommend that um, where possible, yeah. Yeah, great. So so just uh, layers to it. Let's uh, let's see what else we have here. Sorry, just so many so many comments coming in. Thanks for a great session, Chelsea. 
Hashtag enable MFA, no other comment. <laughs> <laughs> yes, enable MFA. If you enable MFA, you will help prevent uh, your, you from seeing me. I well, fantastic. Uh, that's the cue.